I am a fan of basketball. I play it with passion, even though I'm no longer any good. I have passion, and then I have moments. I'm surrounded on the court by players who are better than me, but every now and then I have a moment, and I play for those moments. Because in those moments, at the end of training, I can turn around and trash talk a teammate and we have a laugh. That's why I play basketball. When Max from my team sent me a link to this new podcast with LeBron James and someone else. JJ Reddick, I know, but before this podcast, I hadn't heard of him. That's how little I am a student of the game. I really enjoyed it. Mind the game, it's called. Two guys who know infinitely more than I do about basketball. The plays, the jokes, the awareness of other teams, the familiarity with basketball greats. What was there not to love? So I sent the link to my good friend Chris, who I also play basketball with, and he responded with a big thumbs down. I was shocked. What? And then, huh? LeBron did what to the NBA? Chris doubled down. I said, oh, wait, we have to do a podcast about this. This episode is the result of that. As you will hear, Chris knows so much more than I do about the NBA. I don't even have an argument to pit against him. But it was fun listening to Chris talk about it all. And luckily, I've recorded it all here. Two on a mic, clocking out. Enjoy. Yeah, this is the first time, Chris, that we're going to talk purely about basketball because previously we've spoken about politics and racism and different kinds of issues, but this one is purely about basketball and uh, yeah, which is a bit overdue, I'd say, because we met purely because of basketball, so we play for the same team in Berlin. Um, we haven't had the great season this year, but anyway, hopefully next season things will pick up. But uh, good old Max, shout out to Max, sent me a link to this new podcast with uh, LeBron James and JJ Reddick called Mind the Game. And I thought you'd like it too, uh, because they talk about some interesting tactical stuff. Um, but then when I sent it to you, your response was, yeah, not really interested. They're not my, uh, not my favorite players. And that kind of took me by surprise. Do, do you want to explain why? Well, let's see. I mean, who do you want me to start with? You pick a guy. You can start there. Well, the main guy's uh, LeBron. Um, I think JJ, if it's JJ Reddick or if it's, uh, I don't know, anybody else. I just like JJ for a totally different reason, but. Okay. I can give you my plus and negatives, but I mean, we can start with LeBron James. Um, LeBron James. I mean, look, I, like I said in the beginning, he's a great, he's a great role model. He's an excellent ambassador for the game. Um, but it's just when I first heard about LeBron James, I was in high school, I think we were in ninth grade and he was the first player that they were kind of uh, playing on national TV, um, because he was such a phenom. There've been games on national TV, like championship games, but he was regularly put on TV, I think against like the better player, I think Carmelo Anthony, he played against in high school and they, Sebastian Telfair and they had done these these games and it was super popular and people were like stopping to watch on a Tuesday night and a Wednesday night and everybody was like LeBron James LeBron James okay so then he came out he was with Cleveland and I think when someone is hyped as much as he has been and has so much to live up to then people are, are automatically start to hate on him you know because um, that's just the nature of the beast but and as he went on he Against Cleveland, it was always like LeBron, LeBron, and and he was losing. He wasn't really winning, and he went to like a couple different finals and lost. And then I kind of was like, look, I mean, I hope he gets over the hump. I, you know, I wasn't a big hater then. And then he decided to go to Miami, and he had this huge the decision, and he like sat down, and the whole world stopped for him to say like, I'm taking my talents to South Beach. And it was just kind of like a shock to everybody that in the first time in the history of the NBA. 
uh, a superstar had went to go join up with other superstars to make a super team um, to try to win the championship. And in basketball, it's always been like, you know, basketball always has one superstar on the team, you know, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, you know, the Celtics, Magic Johnson, Lakers, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Lakers, um, Allen Iverson, you know, he played, you know, 76ers. He went to the finals against the Lakers and Kobe and lost, but everybody showed respect to Allen because he had done it with the team that drafted him and he took him years to build the franchise and then try to win a championship. Later on, he left as he got older and went and played in Denver, who Denver was a uh, contender. Uh, it was was just a little bit different, you know, Allen Iverson was on his way out, um, at that point, but when LeBron went to Miami with Wade and Bosch, who are, I think Wade, I think Bosch was also a free agent. It was just kind of like, okay, you have just given up and you just wanted to win a championship. And then it kind of changed the way the NBA and the net later on, you saw like Kevin Durant went to, uh, Kevin Durant was with (laughs) Russell Westbrook and Harden on the same team in Oklahoma City, and they went to the finals and couldn't make it. They got rid of Harden, Westbrook, and KD, and they had lost. And then KD, the next year, instead of coming back and trying again, he decided to go to Golden State. And for me, as a basketball fan, basketball is about starting from the bottom, learning how to dribble, working your way up, and then you usually hit, like, a ceiling of your skill level, and then you, or you feel like what you're good at, you know? So for me... Um, the the young players and fans look up to these NBA players and when they start going to join super teams and making it easy um, it kind of it kind of took away from the game for me a bit honestly Um, and then you know even when you look now now into college basketball they changed the rules where you can transfer now and now you have guys who are playing for three different colleges and in five years and, you know, where before it was like you go, go to your college, this is where you decide you pick to play, you play there for four years, you represent that school, and then you move on to a professional sports or a professional career. And now you got you look at you look at some of these guys Instagram and they, they've played for three different schools since 2022, you know. So it just uh, changed the like the loyalty. And, you know, you, if, you look, if you look at like Man United or something, you know, like gigs, like gigs play for United for what, 20 years. And everybody respected him. He's a legend. You know, if, what if Giggs would have said, all right, we're not winning. Let me go to let me go to Real Madrid and play with the Galacticos because I want to get a I want to get a Champions League, you know, and just gave it all up. That's that's what we're that's how, how I'm comparing what LeBron James did and how he changed the mindset of uh, the basketball to just being like, let's represent my team. Let's try to be the best I can be and be. And because you know, like end of a basketball game, when you lose or win. If you play well and you played hard, the other team's going to come shake your hand. You know what I mean? They're going to respect what you did. And, you know, they, even Damian Lillard, you – like, how many times did they, they, Portland get to that point and he couldn't get over the hump? And what did he do? He jumped and went to play with the Greek freak. Bucks, no. So that's where um, LeBron kind of started this trend uh, of doing that. But then LeBron decided to come back to Cleveland, which I was like, okay, he's going to come back. And he won. He ended up winning, right, when he came back to Cleveland and brought a championship to Cleveland. And then he turns his back all the way again and goes to the Lakers and wants to go play with Anthony Davis. You know, so, you know, Michael Jordan never went to go play with somebody. Kobe never went to go play with somebody. They came to play with Kobe. You know, Shaq came to play with Kobe, won a championship. Paul Gasol came to play with Kobe. And they won championships. You know, Michael Jordan had his team, and guys would come in and out. You know, Luke Longley, would call, you know, came in. Ku coach, um, I forget the point guard with the bald head. He came in to play. You know, like mm-hmm. these guys came to play with Jordan, and he never left to go. You know, Magic Johnson was a Laker the whole time, never left. You know, Isaiah Thomas was with the Detroit Pistons. You know, this is what these teams represent. So. It, it just changed the landscape of basketball in general. So that's where uh, I just like LeBron James. But over the years, uh, I've learned to respect him more because he's just been he has been a stand up guy. And as a black man, there's such a diff- difficulty in the in black culture with finding role models and 
uh, people who, who represent, you know, either you're an athlete, you're a rapper, or you sell drugs. It's, that's that's the choices you have coming out of, you know, poverty in the United States or a bad situation. I'm not saying that every black person in the United States comes from these backgrounds. It's not true, but a large percentage of them do. And to have a person like LeBron James who has, has, hasn't gotten in trouble for, you know, drugs, he hasn't gotten in trouble for being, uh, you know, violent or uh, doing illegal things. You know, he, he married his high school sweetheart. He has two sons. One is in college. One's going to college. Um, he's he's built schools. Uh, he's created internationally. He's invested in other companies like he's the owner of Liverpool. Um, you know, he's so he's he's been a great role model to African Americans or Black men uh, and and people in general, showing you know his power. So that's why I do respect him. Um, but basketball wise and his decision to kind of join up with other superstars kind of threw me off a bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I was quite surprised when you said uh, because you said yeah, he ruined the NBA. Um, and OK, I mean, that's just a private message that you wrote to me. So fair enough. Yeah, maybe that was uh, yeah, a bit exaggerated uh, from your point. You were just giving your thoughts and so on. But people don't realize how much you love college basketball and high school basketball. Um, and for you, I think I'm correct in saying that very often you prefer watching college basketball to NBA, right? Yeah, I always have. I've never been a big NBA guy. I always watched NBA playoffs. Um, I mean, my first memories, I mean, because I watched basketball with my dad and my brother. Um, my dad went to North Carolina. My brother was born in Chapel Hill in North Carolina um, around the time Michael Jordan was there. So Jordan won a championship in 82. It's been 42 year anniversary yesterday. Um, and my mom, you know, so we've always been like Carolina basketball fans. And Carolina basketball is like the history of basketball. You know, if you think about the history of basketball, it started at Springfield College. By do you know who, the, who started it, Zach? No idea, mate. James Naismith. So you have the Naismith Award um, and these types of things. So James Naismith invented the game at Springfield College, Massachusetts. He later went on um, to work at Kansas, uh, Kansas University, taught, brought the game there, started it there, and he taught Fog Allen. And Fog Allen is name of the, of the gym where the University of Kansas plays, and Dean Smith ended up playing for Fog Allen, uh, who, who learned from the guy who invented the game of basketball. Dean Smith later goes on to University of North Carolina, coaches Michael Jordan, um, who became the greatest player of all time. So this is where the game started and the lineage of the game. Uh, it's, it's like this is you know, this is important for me. You know, it doesn't all start with Dirk Nowitzki, how every, you know, who people we play <laughs> basketball with make is the greatest basketball ever. You know, this is like I'm a historian. I'm a cultural guy. I'm a sociologist. Like this is how the game started. These are the lineages, you know, Dean Smith played for the guy that learned from the guy who invented the game, who coached Michael Jordan, who won a national championship. And, they, you, know, they, you know, they always say in, in, in North Carolina or in Chapel Hill, who's the only person to keep Jordan under 20 points? Dean Smith, you know, the greatest one of the great. I mean, to me, the greatest basketball coach of all time. You know, he coached James Worthy, Vince Carter, Antoine Jamison. You know, he's coached, you know, he coached all these guys, Hubert Davis. Um, so you think about all the impact those guys have had in the NBA as well. Uh, Rasheed Wallace, uh, Jerry Stackhouse. Okay, so we, we Ed Cota, we can just go down the line of all the, the kids that he's recruited out of New York and Philly and the West Coast. And Rick Fox, he recruited, you know, he recruited Rick Fox from the Caribbean Islands. Um, and he later played won a championship with Kobe and Shaq, you know, out of Carolina, Hollywood Fox. So this is why when you talk about basketball, and the the game and how the game should be played like i'm a student of the game you know nba is just not a representation of what <laughs> it is you know yeah which is which is crazy because look i i'm like british guy um i grew up in london and i i love basketball from the age of eight or nine uh i remember watching uh michael jordan play live i i played i, I have played the game for so many years now um, but I have nowhere near your level of knowledge with regards to I don't even not even one percent of your level of knowledge of the history of the game of basketball. Mine just comes from a pure passion of playing the game and I like to watch the game. Um, 
but you also have specific reasons for why you enjoy college basketball so much um, and why you also said you watch the NBA, but only from the playoff point onwards. What, why they is that? Play. They don't play. Like, they don't really play. Like, a lot of the guys, especially now, um, the game is different. You know, Seth Curry changed the game as well. You know, he made the three-pointer so powerful. Where when I when I was playing basketball, like, last organized basketball in high school, like, we would only take maybe, I mean, there was only one or two guys who were even allowed to shoot threes. And they would only <laughs> shoot, like, two or three threes a game. And the coach would take them out of the game. You know what I mean? Where now it's like everybody's shooting threes. And it's also, I mean, if you, if you go into the numbers part, I mean, it makes sense. Like, and then this is where we can go into the J.J. Redick theory if you want. So, I, so as being a North Carolina fan, the biggest rival is Duke. So Duke, Carolina, they're both seven miles away to, to, to the most, you know, top universities in the country for, edu- for uh, education as well, and also athletics. Um, but not Duke, not you know, Duke, Duke basketball. They're good at lacrosse and some other sports, but Carolina is good. You know, Carolina has won every championship in every sport, pretty much. You know, what I mean, field hockey, soccer. You know, Mia Mia Hamm, she went to North Carolina. You know, like the, you know, it's one of the greatest soccer women's soccer players of all time. Um, so they're seven miles away, and they're and they're a rival. So they are the biggest rivalry in college college sports, uh, maybe in U.S. sports in general. And they play all the time. And J.J. Reddick played for Duke, and he was is the greatest three point shooter of all time. I honestly think J.J. Reddick. This is a big statement, but like he, I think he at, in college he was a better shooter than Steph Curry. You know what I mean? And and I remember when Steph Curry made his run. Steph Curry was a was a nobody besides his dad, Del Curry played for the Raptors. And Steph Curry was going to a little school called Davidson in South Carolina that wasn't even you know not a good school, and he led them to the NCAA tournament, which is going on right now. And this is where like, you know fairy tale stories happen like Steph Curry was not a, a high profile pick he played very well but when he got to the tournament they went to like the elite eight or something that year with a school that has 3,000 students for schools with 50,000 students you know what I mean and big and big money so uh but Steph but J- JJ Reddick played for, for Duke and Duke Carolina was always a big rivalry and also in those years University of Maryland was very good and they won the national championship in 2002 and i went to the final um in atlanta and uh it was amazing and but jj reddick was a shoot three-point shooter that just didn't miss and he was this white kid i forget where he's from florida or something and he just could shoot lights out i mean he hit every shot and it would just piss people off and he talked shit <laughs> you know what i mean he come around the screen catch quick release wham 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 and you're just like, what the hell? And I remember watching him play at, at Maryland. And I just saw a clip today where people, you know, they, they, they were booing him. They, and just awful to him. You know, he got treated really poorly uh, in college. But so I learned to hate him because it was a Duke Carolina rivalry. Okay. But, I, but I always respected him. And a lot of my friends who are Carolina fans or, or Maryland fans who we all hate Duke, they, they, we all respect him too. We're like, we've never seen anybody shoot the ball that way. Like, yeah, we see Steph Curry shooting it from half court, but, oh, but like, the way that JJ Reddick came across screens and catched and popped and, and, and like it was just it was an art form, you know. And he did well in the NBA. He had a good career, but I think his athleticism deteriorated a little bit as he got older. And he just was like, you know, he was a pure shooter. But also in the NBA, like you have guys who are six nine playing you, you know, consistently and trying to shut you out. But he had he played, he had I think he had a, a good NBA career, probably better than most people thought he would, honestly. So mm-hmm. when you ask about this podcast, those are the reasons why. I just two people that I just I just don't really like. You know, I wasn't I'm not a huge fan. I'm kind of a very loyal sports fan and when I have a sports opinion, I try to keep it to my I keep I keep loyal to my opinion, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um but I mean so who would you say then uh kind of represents the kind of basketball of everybody can roll out the name Michael Jordan and uh, Larry Bird and, as you said, Dirk Nowitzki and so on. Um, but what kind of players nowadays that you see operating in the NBA would you hope uh, will live up to the kind of principles that you've got when it comes to basketball? 
Uh, I like. I really like this dude, um, Anthony Edward, right now. Uh, I think like the like his size and his build and his type of game is what I really like. You know, he can play on the outside. He can shoot it. He can go to the hoop and dunk on you. And then he has the footwork, um, you know, to make to be like graceful and skillful, which I really hope he can get. Um, and he talks a lot of shit. I like guys who talk shit. <laughs> LeBron is always crying. You know, he's you know. Remember the game he got a cramp in like the last minute. He had a, he had to come out of the game because he had a cramp in the F- NBA final. Like, you know, like you know, Kobe. I didn't. You know, I never liked Kobe in the beginning. I mean, I like Kobe when he came out. I was like, man, this guy is nasty. Um, and then like there's a couple years where he just got annoying. The Shaq years were just a little too much because I guess I was I'm more of an East Coast guy, so I was rooting for the Sixers and the East Coast teams always. And then you know Lakers, Lakers, you know the U.S. really like you know it divides into East and West Coast. I mean, you support your local teams, you support your the local coast and your elite in your conference. You know, so for us we were never really like Lakers fans, but. You know, but then Kobe kind of grew on me, and he won with him, and he won with Paul Gasol and those teams, and he dropped 81 points, and he was talking shit, and he would back it up. That's what really got to me. You know, LeBron was just crying too much, but but yeah, Anthony Edwards I think has a good game. I'm trying to think who else. Like, yeah, I mean, the type of basketball I like to watch. You're saying is that what you're asking? Yeah, like guys like this. Um, I always like watching small guys who can score too. So I was a big Allen Iverson fan. Mm, uh, I like Iverson. I like Damian Lillard a, a bit. Uh, I do like the way he's, I do like Seth Curry. Um, but he, you know, he's I mean, grown on me. He's grown. I used to think he was a bit arrogant. I, the the way he like uh, uh, used to use his uh, his mouth guard um, and the way he used to strut and stuff and uh, and so on. Um, I always thought he was a bit arrogant. But then uh, as I kind of watched more and more of the way he plays. Man, he works so hard for his team. He's not uh, big. It's unbelievable. He's like nice guy, Zach. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's not big, dude. And if you if you're able to do that stuff in a league where guys are all spin size or bigger, mm. uh, <laughs> I mean, like it's not easy. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Like, this guy Bronson's pretty good. But like I said, like I really have a lot of trouble watching full NBA games. Um, yeah, yeah, I do watch more because. It's more available here than the college. Like right now, I used to watch every March Madness game because you would start at 12 on Thursday and they play till midnight. And there's 64 teams and you got the big dogs playing the little dogs. You have upsets and um, and you're betting money and you have your bracket. Everybody has their bracket pools. And it was just it's my favorite time of year. Um, but now it's just it comes on so late. I check the scores. I do the bracket. I'm in a couple of groups where people are talking about the games, but, and then like on the, on the zone and stuff, like they, they'll play one game. They won't play the next game. And you're like, you have to keep playing them. Like that's, that's the point of it. You know, you sit at home and you watch 10 games in a row, you know, and they're not as long as NBA games. They're 40 minutes, you know? So. Yeah. And that's fair enough. Um, a thought that occurred to me because obviously we, we've had this chat because you talked about, with regards to LeBron, who's respected the world around, obviously your highest point score in the NBA and so on. Um, but you kind of questioned his commitment to his team. What is an, a chat that we've kind of had in the past? When MB, because NBA teams, that they're franchises, you know, they can, you can pick up a club or an NBA team and move it to another city. So what that kind of tells you is the game is essentially rooted in profiteering from a big city scenario if a club or if a team isn't making as much money as the prospective owners or the current owners would like they just pick it up and move it somewhere else and when this happened for example this happened um with when recently the new jersey nets became brooklyn Brooklyn. nets yeah it became the brooklyn nets um and i was like one minute how the hell can this happen um, and you said to me something really interesting. Uh, you said, uh, Zach, how many lakes are there in Los Angeles? Um, and, and this kind of thing, like, kind of hit me. So practically almost all the teams in the NBA have moved. 
haven't they, at one point or other? So if the teams themselves don't have the loyalty to their region, I suppose it's not too hard to understand that the players won't have their loyalty to their clubs either. Yeah, I mean, also the clubs don't have loyalty to the players. There's guys who are like going to headed to the game and get traded, and they hear about it on the radio, and they don't they don't even get a call, you know? Yeah. Like yeah, the Lakers were in Minneapolis at one point, <laughs> and that, that's that's just not a market. I guess the Timberwolves are there now, but it's just not the market that they want. You know, I think Oklahoma City works because it's the only team there. They don't even have a baseball team, you know, mm. so people buy into it. Um, but I know, like, Nashville, I went to a hockey game, the like Nashville Predators, and the game was, like, pretty full. It was, like, a Wednesday night, you know, and they're not very good. But it's just, it had, it, you know, people want something to do, somewhere to go. Um, so that's important for them. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I mean, NBA is, is a ruthless league. I mean, if you look at the longevity of the players, you, you got guys who have been in the league for 15 years. They play for nine different teams, you know, 10 teams. Um, they're just there to fill rosters. But then you got guys who are, like, skilled enough, good enough, they are playing in Europe who are starting. But it's just, like, you know, are they a household name? Or, um, you know, did they have the size? Or, you know, I don't know what it is, you know. There's a lot of guys you see in the Euro Leagues who played in the NBA for a year or two, didn't make it, and now they're they're crushing, crushing it in Europe. But there's guys in the NBA who just aren't that good and old and just sit, sit on benches, you know mm-hmm. what I mean, and take the league minimum. <laughs> I said, I'd love to do that. I'd do that. Yeah, <laughs> I'd do that in our team. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, no, that's fair enough. But the other day, I I watched a I can't I think it was Atlanta Hawks against the Celtics. Um, and I wanted to say to you, man, you know, you talk about the lack of defense in in the NBA, and they only start properly defending when they get to the playoffs. And, and I have to say, I thought the defending in the it's the second because they played twice last week, um, and the second game, I thought the defending was really intense. Um, but the game finished 126, 125, or something ridiculous. And I and I thought to myself, one minute, if I send this to Chris and say, hey, I thought you said they didn't do defend defending, and you turn around and said, mate, they scored 126 points in a league game. Um, that's not the best defending. Yeah, I mean, is that really a question of poor defending, or do we also have to say that you know, these guys are amazing when it comes to taking it to the hoop? Well, I mean, they also changed the rules as well in the NBA, so you can't be as physical um, with the players. So that gives the players more space and time to score. And, and these guys are shooting really well. That's like I said, like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, like only a couple of guys were shooting threes. And then now every guy on the court, if you can't shoot threes and you're on the court, you're just, you're not a useful, you know I mean? You're not a weapon. So everybody can shoot the ball now. And they, they, and they teach you at a young age to shoot the ball. When we were like young, the tallest kid would never shoot the ball. You make layups. You're tall, you're closer to the hoop, higher percentage. Now you got these guys who are six, 10, seven feet, seven footers shooting threes all more than like the guards, some of the guards. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say, I would say some of it is they are shooting more threes. Um, and that the, and, the, and that the rules change where the guys aren't can't be so physical on defense. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so yeah, it's it's a it's a combination of both. It's hard to tell. You would have to look deeper to the stat to see how many threes were made, how many free throws were shot. Because if a team is shooting, like you see, some of these guys they'll hit like six shots, but they'll shoot ten free throws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I mean, there was a situation where we're talk, not even just threes. We're talking about guards uh, shooting forwards, hitting um, like two point shots over Portingis, um, and, and he's big. I mean, I'm pretty sure if that guy just stood, I could jump off a trampoline and he would still cover me. Um, and, and these guys just hitting shots over his extended arms, and I thought, I mean, that's just you can't even see the basket when you got Paul Singers flying at you and they were hitting every shot. Yeah, but they're professionals. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you see, yeah, but look at football. I mean, my football, yeah, not your I mean, football. Also, they also train like this. I mean, they, they, they have like these trainers who hold up like brooms and chairs and stuff when they train and by themselves, you know, 
Yeah. I can see some videos where they'll they'll have like a a, a ladder with a, a broom on it and they'll do the same crossover drive baseline floater over top the you know the broom into the hoop. And it's mm-hmm. like they, they, they work on this stuff because they have to shoot over these guys who are huge, you know. When ba- when, when what his name is Wimbama. Wimbanyama, yeah. VW <laughs> his hand his hand is at 12 feet when he, it's when he jumps to go block it you know so you're, you're not shooting you're not shooting at a 10 foot rim you're shooting at a 12 foot rim yeah that's just ridiculous isn't it i, you mean, know this I mean this guy i mean this guy was coming out he was blocking people under the basket and then within two steps he was blocking three point shots uh, and that's quite a distance but he can cover it with his wingspan can't he yeah i mean some of these some of these guys like their goal i was watching a like a video a training video and the guy was the, the guy was saying that nba players their goal on offense is be able to get to the hoop from the three-point line in one dribble because it's so they're so quick. Like if you can't get to the from you know catch it, pump fake, one dribble, boom boom, and get to the hoop. Like that's 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 the physicality that they, these guys have. You know they're 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 very athletic. Some of them some of, some of them can get from half court. It might be a slight travel uh, at full speed and with one dribble or two dribbles and get to the hoop. <laughs> You know okay. what I mean? I was yeah. watching the drill. The guy, he, he was catch, he pump fake, rip through, push the ball out, boom, and then boom, boom, and then dunk. Like, you know? And it's like, yeah, forget you that. have no idea. You, no, you no, don't no. See, realize it till you see it. And that's the high, that's also the point of like, why, like, why going to watch college basketball games, like, or high school games at a high level, you're closer to the hoop than at the NBA, you know, because the gyms are a little bit smaller. And you can actually see the athleticism that these guys have. And you can hear, you can hear, like, you can, all you hear are the fans, you know, like in NBA, like my mom used to always complain that she didn't like the NBA because all you hear were the sneakers sneak in the whole game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's like, oh, I can't stand the NBA. Like, she's like, I love high school basketball. My mom would go to all the high school basketball games. Even if I and my brother weren't playing, she'd go to other games, you know, if, if she knew it was a good team. And it was like, you know, some, we knew the other team or players, she would want to go. And like, she loved watching college. But she'd always complain that it was always that the sneak. You know, all you hear is their sneakers because the fans aren't making noise. They're not into it. It's just like an entertain. It's just mainly entertainment. Mm-hmm. You know, in college, like you, all you hear is kids screaming, the fans. You know, respect. I mean, I mean, I really wish you would get into it because you would wa- like it so <laughs> much more. I think you you you're so stuck on the the names of the superstars and blah blah blah. <laughs> that you, like, you it. Don't forget, but, I. Like, don't forget, I religiously watched women's NBA last summer, and I find watching yeah, college, women's, women's college basketball is even better. These girls are like it's it's like the most watched sport in, in, right now. Like, it's but I don't have access to this stuff, girls. man. Where do I go? And I don't like I don't no like these. Yep, yeah, I don't like these like dodgy downloads and dodgy streams. I don't do any of that. I, you have you have Dazzin, right? The zone. No, I don't pay for the zone. They they screwed me up when they went from 15 euros and they doubled their price. I thought, screw you, I'm not going to do that. Okay, well that's where the games are. Yeah, well, uh, but not well, all of them, time, as you've seen. Like, yeah, but maybe next year, uh, or you find one on YouTube and they, and watch one of these games. Like you watch a Duke Carolina game when they had Vince Carter, and you'll just be like, wow, this is. Intense. I mean, it's the same like Vince what, Carter from the Raptors. Yeah, I mean, when he was playing in college, like it was, it was a spectacle, man. And he's on the same team as Antoine Jameson. He played for the Wizards for years. For your you team, know? Washington. Like, these guys are like 18, 19 years old, and you don't, you don't know what like, they're gonna play in the NBA for 20 years, and they're, and they're just playing like kids, and they're dunking on people, and they're making extreme, you know, amazing plays in, in big time games that are on national TV at 18, and then, you know, three years later, now they're playing for the Raptors, but. You get to see them when they're before they get the money, you know, when they're hungry and they're really playing hard. That's 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 the also like in March Madness, like Carolina lost to Alabama, University University of Alabama, and this this guy I never heard of him before, but he's like six ten white dude can shoot can score. I mean like he can really score, and it was like wow. And then you look at the comments, everybody's like oh he's top twenty draft pick, top ten draft pick. And that, you know this guy, if he goes to the right club, you know if he goes to a, uh, the Bucks or he goes to a team that contends and he plays well, you're going to be talking about him in two years. But you know I saw him when he was just in college and he was like 
you know, he had one big game and the NBA scouts were like, man, this guy, he's 6'9", he can shoot threes, he's athletic, and he has good energy and he's tough. And he knows how to play in a big game. And that's what they want. And that's what, that's what, and that's what they're going to draft. So, like, that's why it's fun just to watch these guys develop. I mean, like, when we were, like, even in high school, we saw guys who, um, who played in the league and we were just like, maybe, I remember we played against this one guy who played at Georgetown and he got drafted by, like, the Supersonics or somebody. Um, he only played like one or two years, but he couldn't kind of get injuries. But I remember like when he dunked on one of my friends and my friend broke his ankle because he tried to get out of the way and he couldn't. It was just like so quick, you know, first play but, of the yeah. game, <laughs> He's six, ten, six foot ten. And we were, you know, we were f- 15 years old. And then he just we were coming down the court and they threw an alley-oop and my friend saw the ball go up and he like saw him coming. And he tried to move and he twisted his ankle, had to come out of the game and they dunked. It was like it was like we still laugh about it over beers, you know. They're like, man, remember that time Dewan Summers dunked on you? He's like, and you broke your ankle. He's like, yeah, dude, it was ridiculous. Like, you know, and we used to go to these camps, like these like five star camps or whatever, like in the summer that would just have all college coaches there. You know, these like you know high school kids trying to get recruited, and we were not like, I mean, some of us got like small letters, a lot of us weren't good enough. And but our coach was like, you have to go see what the best players look like what how they play how intense intense they play you know because you or we were playing against a bunch of average kids and we think we're playing well he's like no like you guys are always going to be average but if you go to these camps which up, up to new jersey and we stayed like in a dorm at a university and it was like top 500 kids or something and our coach knew like the camp director got us in so it's like the top 500 kids in the country or in that region and we go and i remember one of the kids was the number one kid out of our state and he went to play at University of Pittsburgh. And I mean, he was about six foot four or five. And he would just get the ball. And we and hit, when he would play, everybody knew, like, oh, he's playing next. So we all go and the gym would be surrounded. And there'd be other games going. There'd be like four gyms in a row, like courts in a row. And then we'd be around this one gym. And he'd get it. And then he'd get it on the wing. And you see him like dribble and like boom, boom, boom. And then just like, and then go past the guy and then go up and just be like, Boom. And like the whole gym is like, oh, and it's just like, what is he going to do next? You know, it was like a, it was like he was playing as children, you know, and then and then he he get on the next side and he like someone throw him an alley-oop, you know, and then he like, it was just like the athleticism was ridiculous. I mean, I remember my brother went to North Carolina basketball camp in 1993 or four. And Vince Carter was a freshman. He was 17 years old or 18. And Vince Carter was there working the camp. Because the players had to work the camp, you know, it's like they have, you know, a couple thousand kids trying to sign up to want to come to the camp to learn basketball at University of North Carolina. It's a big time business. I mean, they probably make a couple hundred thousand off this camp in the summer, all people who just are fans of the university. So any kid can go to the camp. You just have to pay, you know, I think it's a thousand for a week or something. And my brother went. Uh, I remember he, he he came home. He's like, man, he's like, dude, I played against Vince Carter. Like, we were in the parking lot, walk, uh, you know, checking into our dorms for the camp, and Vince was there. And he's like, yo, do you want to play? And he's just shooting around. He's like, I was like, oh, let's play one on one. And he said he just said like he was like his hands were so big, and the way he could control the ball, and then he just was like boom, 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 and then like threw off the backboard and like dunk. It's like out in the park, like outside the dorm, you know. And I was just like, I, I mean, I was six years old, like no way. And then. <laughs> We're, watch, we're watching him on TV later that, that fall. And he's like, and we didn't really, like, he knew he was a big time recruit. But I don't think we knew he was going to be the NBA star that he was. You know, like he was, he was a big recruit. Everybody knew about him, but he hadn't played a game yet. And this is like him just being, having to be at the camp. And he said it was just like his hands were so big, so long. And the way he, he held the ball, like it was like a little kid's ball, you know. And that's when you're like, okay, they're, they're a different breed. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like even that guy we played against last week, um, the tall one. I was like, that's the, that's the kind of guys that you see on in these teams. You know, what I mean? they're that t- that type of big, but they can shoot really well and they can handle the ball really well and they're smart and they're aggressive. Like they're way more aggressive than that guy is. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that's what I was like when I was playing. I was like, man, this is like a you know, not pro, but he has that body type and athleticism that people look for in in, in basketball players. But he just didn't really have. I don't know if he wasn't really motivated, but um, he did. He was attacking himself. But imagine a kid like that who's like really grinding, playing against kids more athletic than him all the time. How good like a guy like that could get? 
really. Mm. Like I wish yeah. I had that body size, <laughs> long, then he and he could dribble a little bit and he could, you know he could shoot, but he just really wasn't like he didn't have it, his skill level was could have been a lot better. So, mm. no, or tough. I don't know. Yeah, just for so people know, so Chris was referring to a game we played, our last league game. We were, we were at the time bottom of our league, and we were playing against the top team, um, and we won. Um, yeah, I mean, we're obviously still gonna review our uh, our league, and we're gonna do analysis on that and so on within our team. Uh, but just on that on that last game, how good did you feel? Um. I felt good. I mean, it, it was kind of strange because, like, I think I was waiting the whole game for them to kind of come back, mm. you know? And I, even in the first quarter, I was like, oh, we're up by, like, seven. I was like, okay. And then I was they, they kind of came back a bit. And I looked at the scoreboard. I was like, damn, we're still up. Um, and then I to the second half, I was – in the third quarter, I think I was like, okay, like, we, we hit him with the first shot. Uh, I think Tom had a shot in the corner. I was like, okay, like, that's what you have to do to, like – let them know that we're still playing. You know what I mean? And a lot of the season, we never gave teams that that shot or that bucket yeah. early in the third. It's saying like, okay, like look, we're we're at the same same pace that we were in the first half. Like you guys have to compete. I think that made them feel like they're like shit. Like these guys are really playing today. You know? So, um, no, I felt good. I felt like the team is finally getting a rhythm of how we should play together. And I don't know if like, um. Like what it is, but like maybe some guys just don't have the basketball IQ. Like they like they're good, at, they have good skill sets and they like to play, but maybe they're just they haven't played enough um, games like this. You know what I mean? To like mm. to understand like you can play basketball in the pickup games and in the street and stuff every weekend, you know, and you can become a really good skill player. But like to be able to play on a team that's playing in a league with refs. Um, you have to have like a sort of a game plan to make it work. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you have to, yeah. like you have to be disciplined on your offense. You have to find, you know, an off. I, I think, I don't think our defense, like, yeah, we had a really bad transitional defense in for a couple of weeks, but I think we got really a lot better at it. Um, but it, it, it took too long. Like, you know, you should be able to adjust in the game transitionally, like where, um, like some of the, you know, some of the guards and stuff, like they just have to stop the ball. And a lot of the times we were taking too many, going to, for too many offensive rebounds, which really um, hurt us. And it's like, take the shot. You're not going to make it, especially if it's a three pointer, like you might as well just go back because it's going to, if it goes in, it's good. But if it's, if they miss, it's going to be long. It's going to bounce high. And it's most likely going to go to the other team, and it, and it's going to go to the other team probably around the the foul line most of the time, or that perimeter, that mid mid range area. And then from there, if it goes, it's going to go to a guard, most likely, who's going to put the ball down, and then they're going to go. So, I think that's just like basketball IQ more. Like I think we got a little bit smarter on it and some of the guys developed a little bit more of like okay let's just get back and play defense like let's take the shot either we make the shot we miss it let's go back let's just give up like not give up but just be play smart like let's not crowd the hoop every time we shoot try and get off with the rebounds you know now i wish you could see the stats from like every game of fast break points we gave up um from yeah. january until now yeah, unfortunately, I only started doing stats later on in the in the league. But I mean, the, the last game was completely different to the other games, um, and our defense really picked up. Um, and you can see it in the number of blocks. I mean, you had six blocks and steals. Nicholas had six. I mean, our guards uh, were, were phenomenal. Um, you know, to see the way that they played, uh, Fabi as well. It helps. Just, like, you know, they, yeah. the, the aggressiveness from the guards helps a lot because. It takes the pressure off. First of all, they can't just do what they want. You know, you have to, if you, they, we have to dictate what they do, right? So then those guys couldn't just drive into the lane. And then when you drive into the lane, you're one on one with the big guys. And then either you get fouled or they get scored on. And then the, and then, the, and then it's like they're yelling at, they're yelling, yelling at each other. You know, stop them. You have to stop. Oh, you should get the rebound. You should have blocked it. You should. You have to slide. You have to help side. No, like eliminate the help side by just stopping them from getting in the lane in the first place. Like help yep. side should be the last ditch effort. You know what I mean? It shouldn't beat you from the top. 
that's the whole point. So, um, yeah, and I think maybe the other team, their guard play wasn't as good as some of the other teams we have played. And yet they were the first, they were the first, they are the first. I mean, they, they're going to win our league quite comfortably. Um, that was only their second defeat of the season. So um, hopefully that gives us a chance. Um, but yeah, time will tell. Yeah, I mean, hey, if if we do go down, then we, we should uh, use next season as a real opportunity to rebuild, uh, put down some firm uh, principles within the team, um, establish our playing style better, and then come back if we can and uh, do, do it again, but better this time. I mean, in general, I think the, the, the players that we've got in the team, I think are really good. Um, and I definitely think we're better than our league position shows at the moment. But uh, we've got to, you yeah, we've got to bring it together in the games more often. We've got to be more consistent. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll do that in the yeah, co- man, coming seasons. Like, honestly, like, I think we have a really good team. We have a lot of good positions. We have a lot of good athletic guys. We have size. Um, we have a couple shooters. But we just have to be able to utilize them well to make us win games. You know, I think every part of the game, like, you know, should, someone should be able to contribute to those games. We don't need one guy who does everything. You know, we need you know, one guy that's getting steals, that's creating you know, extra baskets. One guy, you know, two or three guys getting all the rebounds. You need a couple guys, two, two or three guys that hit some, hit some threes in the game, give them opportunities to hit shots, you know, and then give, give, give the guards opportunities to get to the hoop and uh, get some rhythm that way you know so you have to kind of space it out and share the ball um and give people opportunity to to do what they do best you know i mean so a lot of times this guy's like some guys has a standout game this game then he's nowhere to be the next game you know so like how can you give everybody opportunity to do what they do best on the court within four quarters yep exactly exactly yep something to work on in the summer then uh for next season um chris thanks a lot man um sunday morning you've had a long hard working week uh with humble pie berlin so thanks for joining me and um yeah see you at training on wednesday ready to go All right, mate. thanks man um, have a nice day two and a mic two two